Hello everybody, this is Brett Lonsdale from Lightning Tools and welcome to the uh, the session uh, this afternoon, uh, at least this afternoon here in the UK anyway, uh, with, uh, with Ben Curry, which is understanding the Office 365 security landscape and uh, determining uh, what is your secure store. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Ben in just a moment. Uh, Ben's a great friend of mine. He's uh, we, we go back uh, many, many years, uh, back to our uh, training days at Mindsharp and Combined Knowledge and, and so on. Um, but Ben is a uh, 10 times SharePoint MVP. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's going to be a, a fantastic session. I'll let Ben introduce himself and, and what he does for Summit 7 in, in just a moment. Uh, there is going to be uh, some time at the end of this for questions, um, but you are going to be muted throughout the uh, throughout the session. So if you do have a, a question, you can uh, do one or two things. You can first of all raise your hand, um, and uh, I'll be able to see that your hand is raised, and I'll be able to unmute you. Um, but there's likely going to be a, a chance to do that at the uh, the end of the session. Um, the other thing, if you're using Twitter, is you can use a um, hashtag, which is uh, hash. O365 security, so that's hashtag O365 security, and uh, you can post your questions there. I know Ben's going to be uh, watching that, so if you do have any questions, he'll be able to uh, also answer that as well. Um, so the only other thing to say is the session is recorded as well, so if you need to drop off, don't worry. We're going to uh, make sure that you will be able to watch that back at a later date, and we'll be sending out the link tomorrow. Um, but at that point, I'm going to hand over to Ben, so um, over to you, Ben. Hi, thank you, Brett. Um, and by the way, Brett, can you see my screen? Absolutely. Yeah, all is good. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Brett, and I appreciate the opportunity to present here with you today. A little bit about me, my background. I have been an MVP for a long time. I'm their lead architect at Summit 7 Systems. I am a CISSP, which is a security professional. I spent several years at NASA as a security uh, engineer and security architect. I've written several books. So that's my kids' college fund, I like to joke, but uh, definitely uh, take a look at, we have a new one on IT Pro to Cloud Pro. So how to move from an on-premises SharePoint mentality to a SharePoint online mentality. There you have my email, my Twitter handle, Curry Ben. And as Brett said, if you have questions on today's session, Hashtag O365 security, and that's an O and not a zero. So office as an office. It's a little bit up. Those are the latest, uh, some of the uh, more relevant books that we've written. But notice the one from IT Pro to Cloud Pro that is the newest one that came out last fall. So let's begin. So 146. It's the average number of days an intruder is in a system before they're noticed. And that's a scary number because you think about what they have access to, what they've copied out, um, the damage they could have done in that 146 days. So keep that number in mind. 20%, I love the statistic, it's the chance your organization will be targeted by cybercrime in the next 12 months. Currently, one in five companies is annually targeted by some type of cybercrime. 3.8 million US, the average cost of a data breach in the United States of America. Um, obviously, there are a lot of large companies in that number, but even a breach on a small company can be catastrophic. 400 plus, it's the number of security configuration items we must configure and manage in Office 365. Most people I've talked with, I think that number is closer to 80 or 100. That number is 400, and it can be as high as 1,000, depending on your license type and your security needs. 29, that is the average Office 365 secure score. I checked this morning, and Microsoft publishes this number, but that's out of a possible score of 400. So the average secure score is 29, and that is scary. And what that means is people are putting their data, their email there, they're using Yammer and their Skype, OneDrive for business, but they're not configuring security on the platform. It means they're, they're hugely at risk. That number should be at least 200. For, um, I think, anybody we've ever audited, that number should be at 200. The average is 29. I'm going to show you how to run that report, and we'll go through the analysis of it as well. So here's our agenda. Why do I need security? not going to spend much time on it. We're going to talk about secure scoring and threat analysis. 
I'm going to give you a quick tour of tenant and global security, then SharePoint online security, followed by OneDrive for business security. We're going to talk about the data governance and security in 365. There have been a lot of changes there recently. And then last, we'll go through as much mobile data security as we have time for. Many people aren't aware that Microsoft has the largest compliance portfolio of anybody in the industry. So I pulled this slide to give you an idea of all of the compliance and certifications they've had in uh, the world. So why are we talking about security at all? Well, first, there's risk, and we, what we refer to as a risk profile, and that is your exposure to a risk of loss. Without some defined risk, it's difficult to know how much to invest in your security. If you're putting data that has confidential information or it has compliance data, maybe it's healthcare or it's uh, PCI credit card information, well, then you have a higher risk. If you're just putting general data out there, then maybe it's less. You hear the word mitigate a lot, and mitigate does not mean it's 100% risk reduction. What mitigate means is we've either put some protective measures in place or we bought insurance that lowers our risk to an acceptable level. If it costs us $100,000 to protect a $50,000 resource, that doesn't make sense. So that really comes from the organization and that's a conversation with the business about what's the risk to the data we're putting in it. I like to call good security, I call it sweet rules and controls because so many people build their Office 365 and when they're done, they come in and spread it over and it looks just like that cinnamon roll. Sorry if I made you hungry. I actually kind of wish I had one right now. but. Uh, when doing 365 security, we need to be baking the security in. So when we're doing our design and our site structures and our metadata and building that one drive for business, we need to have security integrated throughout that discovery, design, and implementation process. And there are three primary types of controls in Office 365. The first is what we call procedural. Some of you would call it administrative. That's policies, procedures, standards. It's the stuff you tell people to do, and management enforces it. The second is a technical. It's also called a logical control, and those are more, we're more familiar with that. That's passwords, mobile, mobile device management, um, access control, and so forth. Now, really important, in Office 365, the physical controls are by Microsoft. So when you get an Office 365 tenant, Microsoft has given you a service level and they are guaranteeing that physical security. What we have are two layers of security. So let's talk about that service level security again. This is what Microsoft controls, and we inherit much of the compliance from the Azure platform. Office 365 is built on Azure, if you didn't know, and so we can inherit that compliance and security controls that's in the data center. Microsoft has already certified these data centers um, across the globe. But then the second, and I like to call this the data level that's in our tenant, this is what we have to manage and that's what we're talking about today. Microsoft has done a lot of the hard work, we just need to do our due diligence on top of it. So where do I start? You have to know what you're protecting. So the data we put up there, we must know protecting and, and, and why. Um, a security plan and governance plan, you still need them. I know people don't like doing them, but it's really critical, especially in the cloud. The upside to the cloud is we can access information anywhere, anytime from any device. But that's also a risk because we can access data anytime, anywhere from any device. Microsoft defines the threat in Office 365 as data spillage, and that is accidental data's gotten out of our network, data exfiltration, that is someone has found a way to hack our data, uh, account breach, stole your password. By the way, account breach right now in the United States, this is not just Office 365, is 51% of all cloud breaches is actually an account breach. Data deletion, elevation of privilege, malicious insider and spoofing. 
And we'll talk more about this as we go through this today. So let's talk about our secure score first. This is not the end all be all of 365 security, but it's a really good starting place. Microsoft is working with insurance companies, and you can actually now lower your insurance the higher your secure score, score is in, uh, with some insurance brokers in the US. So let me just go over to a secure score. What I did was, What I did was create a tenant just for this today so you can see this. And you'll hit, see here in the top, their standard disclaimers. Up here to the right of dashboard, this would be our score analyzer. Let me refresh. Score analyzer. And if we had data, this would show a lot of data here, all my accounts, breaches, um, so forth. So as you can see here, my secure score is 40 out of 344. Um, out of the box, it's around 27 to 29. I actually did a little bit of security just to make sure nobody hacked this new tenant. So that's why the score is a little higher. You can see that my maximum possible score is 344. Now what they've done for us is they've given us our target score. So based on the analytics across Microsoft uh, global, and they have like 200 billion logins a day, uh, they give us a target score. So let's look at some of the uh, action items. Mul uh, Multi-factor authentication for global admin. That's a really important thing, by the way. Microsoft believes everybody should be multi-factor now. Uh, auditing, you know, sign-ins and multi-geography. -ge so these are all of those items that if you do these, will raise your secure score. They're going to help your security posture. Now what's interesting is we also have the slider bar, and I'm going to move this uh, down, and I'm going to say, let me, uh, we're going to just shoot for a 205 secure score. So you can see this right here. We're going to just shoot for a 205 secure score as step one, and what it will do is trim this down to nine actions, the top nine actions we need to take on our tenant and then that will raise our secure score. If you look at your score analyzer, we can see some actions. For example, um, designate less. So if we open up one of the actions, it will actually show you the threat you will have if you don't correct that action. And here we see account breach, elevation privilege, malicious insider. If you actually select one of these threats, it will give you a full description of what Microsoft considers an account breach. So if you're curious about what each of those meant in the PowerPoint slide, now you can go run your secure score. I would challenge you to do that, and they will tell you what it is. So once we have our secure score done, and you've decided what you will and won't fix, you probably are gonna put this on a timeline, say over a year or six months, and you're gonna address these security issues over time. Well next, let's look at external sharing inside of Office 365. Office 365 gives us the ability to share with users outside of our Active Directory. So I will show you that. So what I'm going to do is show you this from the OneDrive console. That's where I've gotten used to this. And we're going to go to sharing. So at the top, we have the option, do, will we let users share SharePoint content with external users? And it's an on and off option. Now what's important to know is this doesn't turn it on for each site collection. What this does is it enables site collections to be the, given the ability to share. So what I'll show you here, I'm going to go to the SharePoint Admin Center. I'm in the SharePoint Admin Center, and I am actually on a live site. We have an option here you can see. 
called sharing. And what this does is this gives us control on a per SP site by SP site basis. So on this site collection, we do not allow sharing. You know, if this is a company confidential, if this is your marketing HR, I would not allow anybody to I would not allow anybody to share that externally. So make, you know, smart decisions. Maybe you create a site collection and you treat it as an extranet so that you can share with other people, you know, that's a good practice. And then we have three options. I'll talk about those, those more in the OneDrive for Business section. So external sharing, and the reason I put that so far up in the deck is because it's one of the first things you need to know. Because if you have a tenant today, the likelihood is you may already have this turned on and users may already be sharing externally. What actually happens so you know under the hood is it's creating a guest account in your Azure Active Directory. So when I share with an external user, it actually creates a guest account, and then we can manage that like any other user. To manage those users, I'll show you later, you still have to go to Azure Active Directory to manage those guests. I can't just skip over the basic security and compliance controls, but I'm going to make an assumption that most people on this call know site collection permissions and site permissions and exchange permissions, user groups and policies. But I just wanted to, to call out, don't forget about all the site security we, were already, we already knew. Permissions, permission levels, like uh, lightning tools, they have a tool that's perfect for this. You know, if people come into your tenant and somebody else is leaving, we can actually map those roles across. So managing permissions and permission levels. That's classic SharePoint security. We need to continue to use that, continue to use the third-party tools that we used to use, but in the cloud. So don't forget those. I could just call out one thing here, and that is know, know that many of the 365 security mechanisms or features are now universal, if you will. They cross lots of products in the Office 365 platform. So now we can, we can make a change centrally. These are Azure services, by the way. Things like DLP, information protection, ASM, those are things that actually live outside of 365 but affect all of it. So, for example, if I create a DLP policy, I can apply that and it will work in Exchange and SharePoint and OneDrive. So it can cross all those boundaries which is good because this gives a centralized compliance and security control of our tenant. But it's a mindset change from on-premises. Um, it's similar, similar to how a service application could work across lots of site collections. A lot of our security and compliance features can work across the entire platform of 365. Next, let's talk about OneDrive for business security. This is a hot topic with most of my clients. We do, this is actually probably this entire year, a lot of it has been around OneDrive for business security and the controls. On the upside, Microsoft has given us now a full governance dashboard, and it's really simple to get to. It is admin.onedrive.com. Log in with your 365 admin credentials. It will take you directly to the sharing screen. So instead of showing you PowerPoint, I'm going to walk you through that. So let's go over to our OneDrive for Business screen here. Let's talk a little bit about the options. Now, we looked earlier at, are we gonna allow users to share SharePoint content? And we said yes, but we have the same option for OneDrive. Now, something to call out, it can only be as restrictive as least as the SharePoint content. Let me show you what I mean. If I were to set SharePoint sites that anyone can share, including anonymous users, which by the way scares me to death, but there are some use cases for it, then we would have that option in OneDrive for Business as well. So you would see anyone, including anonymous users. If I change that policy, I'll show you here at the top. So let's choose uh, anyone, including anonymous, to see how they match. I'm going to restrict it and say, in our tenant, only new and existing external users, and it's going to change that. Let's talk about the default sharing links and how we share. There are three types of individuals, 
I'm going to go slow because it's something really important and commonly misunderstood. Direct, and what that means um, are people who already have permission or they're internal. And I'll tell you what's a better way. I'm going to leave this open and show you here. So anybody inside of our organization, any external users, and here's what an external user means. It means that, that user has a Microsoft account anywhere. Office 365, Xbox, it doesn't matter. As long as they have an authentication to any Microsoft service, we can share that data with that account. So while that security is not as good as our internal, it's a whole lot better than anonymous access. We have some other options here. We can actually block the sharing or allow on selected domains. So if we have domains we don't want our users sharing with, or maybe we only want to share with federated partners, then we can actually limit the domains that they can access, so allow or block. Our next two options are external users must accept sharing, you can read. What this does is it forces that user to use that Microsoft account we shared. It means they can't use a different account to come into our network. Why that's important is because we may be auditing all of our guest accounts and we don't want them coming in under another account name. And then the last option, which also scares me to death, but it is let external users share items they don't own. I have not found a use case for that. And I, as a security professional, that scares me to death. But I'm sure there's a use case. It's in the platform. Uh, it's probably a good use case. Next, I want to take spend a little time here on device access and compliance. So what's nice about what you're looking at here, this is actually part of the Microsoft Application Management Suite, MAN, that's in Windows or Azure Intent. They've given us a free subset of that to manage the OneDrive, OneDrive client on people who access it. This is pretty cool, and this is, this is recent, last few months. But we can now allow access only from specific IP addresses. We can actually block access from apps that don't use modern authentication. And then we can look at policies. So block downloading files in the apps. Block taking screenshots. That's an Android setting, but there's one for iOS as well. Encrypt data. You know, block printing, block backing up. Let me say this. The block backing up app data. The reason that's important is because if they're syncing OneDrive and, and, uh, and files into Word, Excel, PowerPoint, if they back it up, let's say it's an iPhone, they back it to iCloud, you now have corporate possible confidential data in iCloud, so we block the ability to back up only this data. They can still back up everything else on their phone, but what we're saying is the Microsoft apps and OneDrive, you can't back that up to iCloud or to whatever Google people back it up to. I haven't had a droid in couple years. We can actually require an app passcode, and this is different than the device. I'll talk about this more in just a few minutes, but we can actually have the app um, reset based on, say, five attempts. And if you're iOS, we can actually allow the fingerprint. So every time I open OneDrive for Business, as an example, on an iPhone, I can use my thumbprint and authenticate to OneDrive each time. What this does is this really allows us to secure that data on the mobile device without us needing to own the device. It can still be bring your own device BYOD. And this last option, I love this option. You'll see it in Intune and it's called um, Selective Interval Wipe. But what this does is every 90 minutes, we can require the user um, to re-authenticate but we can actually have the data or the app essentially wipe itself, let's say after 90 days. So if someone leaves our company and we're worried about the data and they're not logging in, that's fine because after 90 days, they're gonna lose that data anyway. If they do log in with it, we're still gonna wipe it because we likely have a remote wipe policy and we're just waiting for that app to come online. So this gives us a way to erase some of that data or wipe that data even when that phone is not phoning home to our tenant. And I don't have time to go through this, but I want you to see this 
because this now applies to OneDrive for Business as well as SharePoint Online. We have full auditing, full data loss uh, prevention, retention, e-discovery, and rich alerting. So all of this is now available in our OneDrive stack. So when someone tells you there's not enough compliance and security, you need to tell them you haven't looked at it lately. So I'm going to go back to just, you know, I've got to do a shout out. You've got to at least still look at those global security items. People overlook this in their security planning and who can, who has the permissions to change this? If someone were to change your DNS, for an example, your entire tenant will go down, no access. So that's actually a really critical permission. Same with your Azure Active Directory Sync um, and your, if you're using ADFS, which more and more people are using ADFS. I'll talk about that in a moment. I mean, who's managing the app launcher and who's managing groups and teams? So take a look at all of the features that you're leveraging and you really need to put a process owner to each of those so that we know we know who we can go to and uh, ensure their security or at least we know who to point the finger at. What you really don't want is for all of this to be pointed back to you because this is a lot of work. Um, we have rich auditing reporting in the platform as well. But the problem I run into a lot with clients, the first question I ask is to what standard? Now, some are financed. If you're FinServe um, or if you're DOD or if you're MOD, we have, a, we have a really good idea of what it should look like. But a lot of people, they're just in 365 in their company, and they don't have really strict guidelines. And so it's a, they're a little unsure of what to audit report on. That's hard. To take a really good security stance that doesn't cost you a lot of money, that's probably where you start. But I would go talk to the business. Let's talk about the data and what that risk. This goes back to that, that risk definition in the very beginning because we have to put a cost with it. See, in Office 365, we can't just enable all of the security controls. Why not? Well, depends on your license type. If you don't need rich security, maybe you get away with like an E3 license. But if you need rich compliance, multi-factor authentication, um, mobile device management, then you're going to require what's called an E5 license or an EM, EM plus S, so an E5. Well, that's a substantial change in cost. This is why it's so important in the beginning to define the risk and what the cost is because depending on that, we're going to change the licensing inside of our tenant. So it directly affects licensing. That licensing directly affects the features we have available to ensure security in our platform. Reporting is done within each product stack, and that's by default. Um, if you have a, a better license, you can do that through advanced security management. But I would strongly consider at least an E5 license for all of your security professionals and admins. It's going to give you better insight, better reporting, and some aggregated reporting capabilities. So standard alerting, I'm going to show you the different uh, between the standard alerting, and I just gave you the URL here, and advanced alerting. So the ASM stack gives us advanced alerting, which is really slick, but it also adds these detection to your platform. This is a very compelling add-on. Uh, it, 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 it will stop traffic based on any of these. Golden tickets, malicious replications, anomalous logins, what does that mean? It means I've got a login from Russia and I've got a login from San Francisco within five minutes of each other. It can, we can actually then suspend that account so we can actually look at the, the behavior. Unknown threats, password sharing. And the way they're doing this is they have so many data centers and billions literally now of logins a day and they can see the threat analysis and their services learn it globally. So let me take you in and show you what that looks like. So what I want to do uh, is give you an, an overview of how to move around your admin console. Some people are new to it and they definitely don't know how the admin security console works. 
Now you can tell that I am a tenant admin because <laughs> I've actually made my admin block larger than the others so I can easily find it. So I'm gonna go into my admin and what admin does, you're gonna see in the top is everything that is essentially global, if you will. So from home to health is primarily making changes or applies to my entire tenant. When we want to get into each individual, I'm going to select admin centers down here, and then we see all of the different admin centers at our uh, that we can use. The one I want to show you now is this security and compliance admin center. Now this is going to look different depending on your license type. So first I want to show you the out of the box standard alert. And for example, I'm going to say view alert. I may have already cleared those out. Go to the dashboard. So from here, we can see basic alerts across at, uh, our tenant, some aggregation. And we have some control here over our alert policies. So we could add a new alert policy here. It's fairly basic. Give it a name. We can choose a severity of, say, medium. And the category is, you know, threat management. So really basic console. It's better than nothing is what I would say, but it really lacks what most organizations require for security. If you have an EM plus S license or you've licensed or you have an E5, you're going to see the other option here called manage advanced alerts. This link isn't just for advanced alerting. It actually takes us, you can see here, to advanced security management. Now if you'll notice in the URL on the top, you can see that we changed our URL. It is now portal.cloudappsecurity.com because what it is, it's actually an Azure service that we use to audit and alert off of our O365 platform. So in the when we enter this, most people are going to see all of their policies. I only have one in place today, and that's your that's anomaly detection. And you can only, by the way, have one anomaly detection policy. But we can create additional activity policies. So for example, let's create an activity policy. We can choose one of the templates by Microsoft. So let's say multiple failed user logs or you know, administrative activity from a non-corporate address or potential ransomware activity. After the last week, don't you want to take a look at that one? So what this would actually do is it would look at all of that email traffic. As soon as Microsoft learns of a ransomware anywhere in the globe, it immediately puts that signature in the machine learning for exchange. So if you license advanced threat protection here, same suite, then you would not have been affected by the last ransomware. So a lot of people that were under this ASM, they didn't have problems globally because Microsoft rapidly shut that down based on this advanced security management. So something to keep in mind when your management tells you, I don't know if we want to spend that extra $2 or $3 a month per user, you could bring up ransomware and maybe that changes their mind. There's a lot else you can do with it. I'm not going to start with a template. I'm just going to call this test for now. And we give it a description of what it does. I won't do that, though. So here, I'm going to say this is a high severity. And we're going to say this is category is access control. And then we have either a single activity that matches, or we're going to say repeated activity by a single user. What we're going to say is if somebody does this for five times within 30 minutes in a single app, then let's and match this. So what we're going to do here is, let's say files or folder. Now let's do this. I 
on my activity ID. And we can match, uh, let's show you this. I'm missing. Let's say it's a user from a domain of gmail.com. And then we can add additional filters. Say, for example, administrative activity is true. Then we can create an alert. And there's a lot of options here, by the way. There are a lot of options because each one of these has a different uh, subset of options. We're then going to create an alert. We could send it as an email and or we can send it as a text message. So if you have a critical alert, this will actually text you on your phone and tell you you have a critical alert that just happened on your tenant. Maybe it's malware. Maybe it's a, somebody from a different country has authenticated and they're an administrator in a site collection. Now, very careful here in the end, this is new. And this is kind of the version one or the V1. We can actually suspend that user in Office 365. So this is behavioral analysis. Machine learning uh, reminds me of Terminator. This is Skynet, but it is actually getting close. Uh, the machines are now learning. And based on your user behavior, we can now suspend users on the platform, but use this cautiously. Um, run tests, you know, make sure that you know this is not going to suspend all of your users. Uh, that would be embarrassing and maybe very costly. But we are now starting to get the ability to, based on machine learning, um, modify login. Last, I'll show you the reporting. It's substantially better. And by the way, you can actually come in and build your own dashboards. You can build your own reports. Um, you can look at app permissions. So these are all of the logs. This is a real time for me. And what I'm going to say is I only want to look at specific, filter to specific applications. So I'm going to say no to Teams. Note exchange. I only want SharePoint and OneDrive for business. And then when we go to users, it'll show me everybody who has been accessing this uh, network. And I can dig in and find out exactly what's going on. This is very useful. Let's say that if you have a breach, you can come in and quickly narrow down. And by the way, this is all of our activity. But I'm going to give you a heads up. It, it's only as good as the audit logs you've set inside a SharePoint site. So make sure that we've actually gone back and we have configured auditing in the site collection. That's that standard uh, site security we talk about. A lot of people are so fo focused on all of these new ones, we forget about the old ones. So I'm going to come over here to alerts, and I'll give you uh, some examples of where we have had that anomaly detection run. For example, we have impossible travel activity. And you can see here that I had a user come in from the Netherlands and the United States within a five minute time frame. Now I could, and he's an administrator, remember I showed you uh, how to build this earlier. We could actually have suspended his account. I chose not to, I chose to get an alert. So good stuff, just be patient, practice. I've given you some screenshots that you will get in this deck afterward so you can talk about what I just talked about, but in text. The next thing we want to do, and this is, I believe this is really important, is to enable the customer lockbox. Now what this does is it prevents Microsoft from being able to log in your client, your tenant, any of it, anywhere without your permission. In settings, security, and privacy, you need to turn it on. Then what happens is the only way Microsoft can get into your tenant is you have to create a, a service request, and it will show up just like you see here on the screen with an approve or deny. When you approve this, it's going to approve an engineer for that visit to come in and enter your tenant. Otherwise, Microsoft does not have access within your tenant. So this is a big deal for those who are concerned with banking or governmental regulations or healthcare. So this is a one slide, just do it, best practice, turn it on, everybody turn it on. Another feature that we're starting to see heavily used in 365 is Azure Rights Management 
service. This is a, a central engine and a database for detecting your data. It's run out of Azure, but you see it throughout Office 365. So to turn it on, this is a little confusing, so I dropped these in here on the slide so you can see it later. But you actually have to go to Setting Services from your Tenant Settings, which you can see here, and you enable Microsoft Azure Information Protection. Um, by the way, some of the screens say Azure Rights Management, some say Information Protection. It appears that Microsoft Azure Information Protection is going to be uh, the name for the future. And then you have to come into the SharePoint Online. So again, you have this umbrella setting across the tenant, and then you go into an individual product here, SharePoint Online, and then you enable it for the tenant. Until you do this, it won't show up in your list in line. It won't show up in your library. Okay, so you have to do this before it shows up in your libraries. So outside in the library, it's fairly apparent. It's uh, you know, under library settings, advanced. But I want to show you the integration with Microsoft Word. So what I have open here is a document. Now we control these Azure Rights Management labels and policies centrally, and we can then push those out that everybody must comply or they have the option to comply. So as you're looking here, I just type some stuff. But you see at the top that this is labeled general. And the user can actually hover over that and see what that label means. They could come over here and they could choose confidential. And these are just the ones out of the box, by the way. You can customize these as much as you want. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to say it's confidential, but anyone. And we can then go manage that policy, and maybe that is you can't print, you can't forward. Um, you can only, and it's only good for 30 days, and it's going to expire. Right? So based on these classification, these labels, we change what happens, and the user doesn't see or know. I think that's what's really important here. We also have the ability, you see here, to custom permissions. I can also come in on this document. You know what's great about this? Is this is not tied to the SharePoint security structure or the OneDrive security structure. This goes with the file. So if someone downloads it to their laptop, they email it to somebody, these permissions travel with it. And that's a really strong feature. Now I wouldn't say I would use this across the board in SharePoint Online, but if you have critical processes, say legal or healthcare, this is good protection for those types of files. So on top of labeling it and classifying it with RMS, we can also come in and we can assign custom permissions to these files. Reviewer, let's say they can only view an edit because I don't want them copy or printing it. All they can do is open and edit this document and nothing else. And then I have expire access. And now this is a new feature that we have seen pushed throughout the entire platform. So in almost every feature, we now can expire access. And of course, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hit apply, but you could. So that's the just a just a quick user experience of that Azure Rights Management, and how leveraging that can protect files within or in addition to your SharePoint security. So let's say you have good site security, but you have some confidential data. We can then come in with Azure Information Protection and secure it even further. Now, another new feature is labels. I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, but we now have labels in Office 365. One of the things we found out testing, and this is kind of yuck, by the way, it's only pushed to mailboxes 10 megabytes or greater, but it's pushed to any SharePoint site. So it still gets pushed everywhere in SharePoint, um, but we do have to select where we push them. When you create a label, just warning, they take up to a full day to publish out. And labels are all about retention. And they really are about retention and classification. So a quick overview of how retention works inside of 0365. Retention always wins over deletion. 
Um, the longest retention is king. Explicit inclusion will trump implicit, and the shortest deletion period wins. So not the longest. If you have a policy for three years and another one for a year, it will be deleted at a year, okay? Because of the way compliance could be written in your, your organization. In Office 365, again, this is something you test thoroughly, but I want you, but you're in this webinar today and I want you to know it exists, uh, so, but use some caution. We can auto-apply labels as well. And what we can do is create a policy and it's based on search, a keyword search. We can create a policy based on search and keywords and phrases. And we can automatically apply labels that we can automatically delete or dispose of. So caution, it is there though. Um, so we, we create our label. Um, it's published. You can see it in Outlook. Here's an example of where I would see the retention policies. Again, if you'll, if you'll step back and look down on everything I'm showing you, we, we have new policies that, that cut across everything. Outlook, Word, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business. It truly is becoming a, a, a truly integrated platform. And then you would see this again in SharePoint, um, OneDrive, and 365 Groups as well. You would see the labeling op uh, option. So that's labels in a nutshell. Another huge improvement, and this changed a lot since January, is data loss prevention. Now, if you haven't looked at data loss prevention in 365 in a while, take another look because it no longer looks like the on-premises. Remember in the beginning, SharePoint 2016 DLP and SharePoint Online DLP looked a lot alike. But Microsoft has merged the Exchange Online and SharePoint Online together into a centralized DLP uh, management location. And by the way, the, the Exchange team wrote most of this, um, and I like it very much. But the old UI is gone, it's gone and going away. It's an active service. Um, and by the way, I've got to say this. Apply your policies in read-only mode. There's an option when you create a policy to say read-only mode, give me alerts, but don't enforce it. And it's a really good idea because you will get false positives. Um, if you've ever used DLP tools, there you get there may be 90 percent as you know 90 is good 80 80 percent is not bad so you will get false positives and make sure that people know that and they can stomach it get executive buy-in so i'll give you uh the top left i just uploaded a file called bunnies and flowers i did it this morning i took a screenshot you can see that there's uh, a red icon and when the user clicks on that icon they can see the issues with it. And they, it's because it contained multiple credit card numbers. Something else I noticed recently is if you go to that file's recent activity, that dialogue in Office 365, it'll actually show you that the system account is the one that last edited it. And that's because it has to apply the policy and put this icon on it. I like this. What this tells me is everything's being audited, even the system account. And that is to meet ISO and NIST standards, by the way. So that way, even a system activity is being audited. Little caution, but DLP is much better. In 365, we also have free mobile device management. So I'm going to show you this. It's fairly limited. So I'm going to go again over to my... Go to my management console, so admin. I'm going to security and compliance. Now here's something interesting. It has been put under data loss prevention. So if you're trying to get to the free MDM, there's two areas you care about. The first is the device security policy. So I'll walk you through. And you get this. Everybody has this with their Office 365 subscription. This is actually a subset of Azure Intune, that new Azure Intune service. 
So if you ever upgraded to full Azure Intune, all of these settings would go across and they would already be populated in your new MDM. I'll show you, we get two basic configuration pages here. I'm just gonna get by the name. And here are what requirements do you wanna have on devices? So things like require a password, I think that's a yes. Prevent simple passwords, I can't answer that for you. Minimum password link, four characters, I like that. We can even enforce four attempts and we'll wipe the device. We wanna here prevent jailbroken or rooted devices. That's a really good idea. Um, and if it doesn't meet the requirement, we have the option of allow access and report violation or block access. Now, it's smart too. Let's say a user is on their Android and they want to think, well, they'll get a pop and they don't have a password. It's gonna pop up and say, you must have a four digit password before you can use OneDrive for Business, Excel, Word, PowerPoint to connect. So they enable a the password, they sync all their data, if they go back, and it's the same on an iPhone or Windows phone, and they remove that password, all of the data from Office 365 is wiped. That's really cool. So they can't be sneaky and get around this policy. And then we have some configuration. The last one is really security and compliance. This one's configuration. Again, notice things like if they back this up, it must be encrypted because we don't want our corporate data out on some SD card unencrypted. Uh, we want to block cloud backup. We don't want them backing up our corporate data. And there's lots of options here. Things like block screen capturing, block video co conferencing perhaps. Uh, be careful, you're gonna make some users really mad if you're not careful, uh, but it depends on your security needs. So those are the free security uh, policies, the free MDM we get. And then over here on device management, is basically where you can see all of the devices running and here you can actually see all of our devices, okay? So just to give you an idea of what's free. Then let's talk about not free, and this will be our last topic today. And that is Azure Intune. Now it's in preview, but it's about to go live, but right now there's already, there is still another Windows Intune as the, the official version, and it works. And the good news is, if you did Windows Intune today, once Azure Intune is completely released, all of that configuration is still there. So you, you don't have to redo it. There's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about what these acronyms on your screen mean. And so um, most of these are clear to me. EMM is Enterprise Mobility Management, and it contains all of the other acronyms. It is really how do we manage mobile devices in our environment. Now, mobile device management, it means exactly what it says, but no more. Think about it this way. It manages the device, so whether that device is encrypted, whether the device has a password. Not what's in the device, but the device itself. When we want to manage apps within the device, that is mobile application management. That means we can block OneDrive from copying to Adobe Cloud, for example. Now it can inherit in some of the device settings if we want, but it can also have its own configuration. Mobile information management. I think about this as keeping content secured on the device, and then mobile content management, it really is that enterprise file share and sync with your content management system and keeping that data um, synchronized and in compliance. So a quick overview of this. Today we're mostly gonna talk about MDM, device management, it depends on the device um, and in, it depends on your compliance needs. It's, it's heavily dependent on what you want. But some of the options, here's a couple of screens. I'll give you an example here. We can create a profile and the first thing you would do is select a platform. Yes, unfortunately, if you have Android and Androids for work and iOS and Windows Phone and Windows 10 and Mac OS, you're gonna have to create five policies. Okay, there's really no way that I know of to copy it. You just have to create five policies because the policies are specific to the available features on the device. For example, an Android you, isn't forced encryption. You may have the drive unencrypted, but on an iPhone, we already know that drive is encrypted, so it's not new. And I put some in here that you can look at afterwards. I just wanted you to be able to see some of the features in case you don't have a subscription to see this yet. And I just put some 
for example, these are the iOS device restrictions, right? So we can we can block explicit iTunes music. We can block in-app purchases. Uh, we can force password expiration. We can even force cellular settings. And so you'll see these in here, and I gave you some samples that you can go back and to give you an idea of what's available. Um, we can even block FaceTime and camera and Apple Watch pairing and Bluetooth. I mean, a lot of a lot of options. Windows 10, obviously it has a lot more settings than an Android or an iOS device would have, um, and there's a lot. And so if we, I put some examples in here, and you can look at some of this out on TechNet as well if you wanted to. But I wanted you to have some of the compliance and configuration screens so you would know. Last part of this. They put this up under Intune, but it's actually Azure Active Directory. And this is about how we do security groups in this modern day and age. Before, we had a security group in Active Directory, and we put people in it, and we took people out. I mean, that was really all we did with them. New in Azure Active Directory are dynamic groups, and these are based on attributes. So as an example, I've shown you in the bottom of some ideas, and you can take these back and think, oh, in my organization, I could do it another way. But for example, if you're in sales or marketing, create a group. And these are based on Active Directory attributes. So if I'm in sales or marketing, um, just like I'm in sales, but we don't want any of our sales engineers in it, we can create a sales group, but not engineers, um, or a region. I want everybody to North America, but uh, not I don't want NE, which would be northeast here over here, but NE is not that region. So dynamic groups are very powerful. They run based off attributes, and they're truly role-based security. And you get that business logic. You get this and if you know type of logic to creating your group. So much more powerful. So I will end with. You don't have to do anything for the Azure AD Identity Protection. This is baked into your tenant. This slide is here just for awareness, so you know all of these um, are already in your tenant. They just work for you. You know, it's information. Have a roadmap and be realistic. If you know you can't configure and manage all of this, then don't put a policy in place that says you must. You know, um, if you need advanced security, you need to buy the right license. All right, so if you need anything but basic security, uh, and make sure you have a layered approach. Use, for example, good SharePoint security layered with some Azure information protection and possibly layered with some good DLP for data loss prevention. Um, I like to say bar our learning curve. We are, uh, we are a consulting firm as well. Uh, we've been through this a lot. Um, you know, Lightning Tools has been through the permissions game for years and years. I was actually part of that team in the very beginning. Some people don't know that way back in the day. But bar the learning curve of software and consulting vendors who know this, because if you've never done this, the likelihood of you getting exactly right the first time is very slim. And, and find a partner. Whoever you partner with, um, find a partner that's willing to transfer that knowledge to you and help you learn it. So. They don't just catch the fish, they help you, they teach you how to fish. So thank you. Hey Brett, I'm gonna hand this back to you now. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ben. That's uh, really informative and um I, I certainly learned a lot myself, so <laughs> really appreciate that. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. No problem. Um so uh yeah, we, we have uh, a lot of attendees still on the uh, the line and um I don't see any hands raised yet, but if you do have uh, a question, don't forget that you can raise your hand, and uh, I'm sure Ben uh, won't mind staying on a few minutes more to uh, to answer any of those yep, questions. Not at all. So, uh, let's have a look. I think uh, yeah, we're, we're getting one or two raised uh, right now. So okay, we have. Okay. Um, hopefully, I get the uh, the pronunciation right. Uh, Faisal Masood. Um, so uh, Faisal, I'm just going to uh, unmute you. Hi, Faisal. Hey Ben, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good, how are you? Good. Yeah. Uh, just wondering if uh, you can send a summary of uh, this uh, session today, like either as a presentation or either as a video, recorded video? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, so this is uh, recorded and it's going to be up on our website later on today. So uh, if you go to lightningtools.com and then underneath the uh, 
community section you'll you'll find webcasts and uh, you will find the webcast there um, and there will also be a link okay. to everybody that registered as well so all right um, Ben okay. you got out of that one <laughs> yeah and thanks for uh, hosting the nice session really informative and uh, good to know okay thank you thanks for the feedback okay uh, any uh, any other questions from anybody just uh, just simply raise your hand and uh, I'll unmute you I'll tell you what I'll do, Brad, as well. Um, afterwards, people may have questions. I'll track that hashtag O365 Security today. So if you have additional questions that you don't get here, you think about it later, just ask the question on Twitter. You've got my Twitter as Curry Ben, and just or you can just drop O365 Security hashtag in Twitter, and I'll answer it there. That sounds perfect. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate it, Ben. And um, I know just a bit about fishing at the end, so uh, so I'll let you get off to, to fishing. I know it's about time you started living on the beach in Florida. So uh, there you go. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Thanks again. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. All right, bye.